Good afternoon and welcome to the session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book by Radcliffe Institute's Tomiko brown Megan, Civil Rights Queen, Constance baker Motley, and the Struggle for Equality. Congratulations, Tomiko, on your new book and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're also very fortunate to have with us the University of Virginia's Risa Golubov and Duke University's Timothy Lovelace, Jr. to lead off our discussion this afternoon. Welcome, warm welcome to both of you as well uh, to this seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair the seminar with Eric Arneson of the National History Center and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Over the past decade plus, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Prior to the pandemic, we would meet on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center, but we've been very pleased to come to you via Zoom and Facebook now for the past two years, and we're delighted that many more people have been able to participate in these sessions. I'd like to invite you to join us next week uh, for a discussion of Nancy Foner's new book, One Quarter of the Nation, Immigration and the Transformation of America. That's... Um, uh, next week, actually, I think it's two weeks from now. Yes, I'm sorry, two weeks from now. Um, uh, please join us for a session on Nancy Foner's book. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support. Details on how you can support this seminar are available in the chat right now, or simply go to institutional websites um, and you'll find uh, ways to donate the links there. A quick word on the, um, the, pr uh, the process this afternoon. Um, after the uh, panelists' um, uh, discussion, we'd like to invite all of you uh, to join the discussion. You can do so in three ways. Our preferred way is to bring you in live, uh, 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 by and, and for uh, uh, in order to do that, please um, uh, use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. Uh, you'll be queued, uh, and uh, we'll call on you. Uh, once we call on you, please unmute yourself. Uh, you could also uh, uh, post your question or comment in the Q and A function. In my case, at the top of the screen. Um, uh, it may be elsewhere for you, uh, and Eric will put uh, your comments and questions to um, our speakers. And finally, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, feel free to email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. With that, I'm delighted to turn the Zoom, over, Zoom room over to my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Eric, all yours. Thank you very much, Christian. It is a sincere pleasure uh, to welcome to the Washington History Seminar this afternoon, Tomiko brown Nagin, who is Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She's also the Daniel P. S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law and Professor of History at Harvard. Her 2011 book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long Civil Rights Movement, explored the civil rights movement through the vantage point of interactions between national and local lawyers and activists. It won six awards, including the Bancroft Prize. An expert in constitutional law and education law and policy, Dean Brown Nagin is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and the American Philosophical Society, amongst other institutions. And today, we are delighted to welcome her to talk about her just published book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley, and the Struggle for Equality, published by Pantheon just several weeks ago. This Zoom room is all yours, Dean Brown-Nagan. 
Great. Thank you so much to Eric and Christian for having me at the Washington uh, History Seminar. And thanks to my interlocutors for being here, my former colleague from the University of Virginia and my former graduate student advisee uh, from the University of Virginia. Delighted to engage in a conversation with you about my book, Civil Rights Queen, which I am so happy to have out in the world. You have no idea. Um, <laughs> I was determined to complete this book when I became a dean. And over the course of uh, several years, I was able to do so and was determined to get the book published because you know, Constance Baker Motley was a giant in the law. She had tremendous impact. She was a counterpart to Thurgood Marshall, Mr. Civil Rights. And yet, uh, when I was writing my book, Courage Descent, and used, wrote a biographical sketch of her because she litigated the Atlanta school desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court, I noticed that uh, there was relatively little literature on her, certainly not what you would expect given her role in changing the legal architecture of this country. And so I set out uh, to correct the historical record and just explore a number of themes, which I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, first, I want to, for the benefit of those who uh, who may not know that much about Motley, I wanna give an overview of her career, um, starting with her time as a civil rights lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She worked there for 20 years. Uh, Marshall hired her on the spot after partners at Wall Street law firms turned her down. And uh, it was all to the advantage of the civil rights movement because she developed a reputation as an excellent lawyer known for her cross-examinations and her skill uh, in appellate courtrooms as well. She worked on a number of landmark cases, including Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and then in the wake of Brown, litigated several other school desegregation cases, Atlanta, Savannah, Mobile, Nashville, uh, and so forth. Um, then she helped to desegregate higher education in the South, including the University of Florida College of Law case, the University of Georgia, uh, and Ole Miss, which she called the second battle of the Civil War. But that's not, not only it. She also represented Dr. King and the Birmingham Children's uh, marchers and um, argued and won nine of 10 cases at the Supreme Court. And to give you a sense of her range, those included Boynton versus Virginia, uh, the interstate transportation case, Ham versus Rock Hill, and Looper versus Arkansas, the trespass cases in the context of uh, sit ins, Hamilton versus Alabama, which established a right to counsel during arraignment for criminal defendants in capital cases. Uh, then, after that, she had a brief career in politics, making history as the first woman Manhattan borough president. And finally, uh, she capped off her career with a judicial appointment. Lyndon Baines Johnson appointed her to the U.S. District Court in New York in 1966, the first Black woman ever appointed to a federal court, only the fifth woman. The confirmation process took seven months. Uh, uh, Johnson had wanted to appoint her to the Second Circuit. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the appointment to this court was a triumph. It uh, uh, re reported on the first page of the uh, New York Times. Uh, and I, over the course of my book, in addition to exploring uh, her career in um as a lawyer, I spend quite a lot of time discussing what she was able to achieve on the bench. And I want to, in addition to um, saying that my overarching aim is augmenting and correcting history, which is important in its own right, the project seeks to yield insights about other uh, questions. First, I was very interested in how uh, Motley's commitment to social justice, to equity, found expression in three different professional roles, uh, very distinct professional roles. Uh, 
I'm interested in the gender question. Uh, Motley both embody change. Uh, she was a pathbreaker in so many ways, and yet I do explore ways in which she uh, encountered disadvantage in her career, including the uh, incident in 1961 where she was passed over for Thurgood Marshall's position when he took the bench. But it's not only that. I, I really seek to explore how gender, um, uh, including reproduction uh, and, and a whole horse of things, influences a life course and opportunities in the workplace. Uh, and also how leadership styles uh, and perception of leaders, leadership capacity, I should say, can be colored by gender stereotypes. I consider the judicial role. Now, when Motley was appointed to the bench, women's rights groups and civil rights groups were overjoyed. Uh, they thought that uh, with one of their own on the bench, she would be able to achieve tremendous things, sort of like uh, when she was a gladiator in the courtroom as a lawyer. Um, she was one of the first to, quote, diversify the bench. And I, I want to consider and have considered in this book what she was able to achieve over her 39 years on the bench. I think there are risks and rewards to the project of diversifying the bench, and I use her life to talk about it. And then I meditate on the James Baldwin question. What's the price of the ticket uh, when outsiders enter the establishment? How do they wield power? At what cost? Uh, and with what reward for their identity group? Um, and let me go to the um, question, the judicial role question, uh, which I think will probably be of most interest to this audience. Um, so both her detractors and her supporters thought that Motley's identity mattered, and it did uh, to her judgeship, both before and after confirmation. Uh, before confirmation, it mattered because in addition to uh, citing her race explicitly as a disadvantage for appointment to the court. Uh, there were those who thought that her civil rights practice uh, made her underqualified or even unqualified uh, to sit on the federal court, which I'll explain uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, after her appointment, there was resistance to her on much the same basis um, with lawyers bringing recusal motions, uh, arguing that because she was a black woman, because she had been a civil rights lawyer, she could not be fair. Uh, the, the case that makes, um, that illustrates this point in my book is Blank versus Sullivan Cromwell, which is a sex discrimination case where the lawyer made this argument. Uh, she rejected the argument in a decision that still is cited uh, for the proposition that identity al alone is not a basis for disqualifying a judge from a case. Um, what else did she do on the bench? Well, she actually was able to, in a number of cases that implemented the Civil Rights uh, Act, to decide in ways that would seem to um, uh, affirm the confidence that those activists had that having her on the bench would matter. And I note a number of those cases, including, including Blank itself, where there was a settlement that opened up the law firm world to women. Uh, there was Lucky versus Time Warner, which in a constitutional case where Motley decided for a female journalist who wanted to cover, um, cover in full uh, professional sports. This is the MLB. It was one of the most uh, controversial cases of her career. Uh, and yet, when one looks back on it, obviously she got it right. She couldn't have decided in any other way. And yet there was a lot, just tremendous pushback against her. Um, and to, you know, I, I both use case studies to talk about Motley's career. I also conducted um, empirical analysis to get a sense of how she did over time. And the long and short of it is that um, there's just no good evidence that her race or her gender were drivers of outcomes in her courtroom. And 
People are surprised by this, but it's entirely consistent with the literature, um, which I can talk about uh, if people are interested. And I, I will also say that I use the, um, the judicial career to you know, talk about, well, why is it that um, uh, Motley tends to look just like or more or less like other judges? And that has to do with her judicial philosophy. She valued um, uh, professionalism over ideology. Um, she, there are hard factors like precedent, particularly for district court judges, it matters. Uh, then soft factors, you might call them, like um, the culture of the court, professional norms, personality, culture, uh, variables related to the case itself, like the quality of lawyering, uh, the identity of the parties. So, for instance, there are very few cases uh, frankly, where Motley decides for blank, Black plaintiffs in discrimination cases. But where she does, it tends to be uh, what you might call a deserving uh, kind of plaintiff. So I talk about this case involving a, a candidate, a police officer, uh, and where she pulls out all the stops. Uh, and I, I use that when to sort of tie back into a uh, discussion of the politics of respectability in which she very much believed and made no apology for. So overall, I decide that or um, conclude that uh, Motley was not a revolutionary on the bench. She was more of a workplace uh, reformer, uh, unlike when she was a civil rights lawyer where she was a, a gladiator. And yet her story helps to demonstrate the value of symbolism to the legitimacy of public institutions. She argued uh, in favor of the appointment of women and people of color judges on this basis, not because she said they would do something totally different than white men, but because the appointments would demonstrate that government is fair. Um, and so, in a way, I think the overarching theme of the book is the paradox of change, um, how her ascent to the bench is important. Um, but if we are seeking, as so many people do, to draw a straight line between personal success and uh, uh, group outcomes, uh, then it, it's, it's disappointing. And yet, uh, I think that the story of her breakthroughs in so many ways does underscore an anti-discrimination imperative uh, that uh, the legal profession, the judiciary should be open to all people of intellect and character, regardless of their origins, obviously. And I am happy to, as I said, to tell her story. It's so rich. It is able to illustrate so many uh, themes and enlighten many questions. And I will stop there and turn it to my interlocutors to offer a perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now uh, I will introduce um, our first discussant this afternoon, Timothy Lovelace Jr., who is a professor of law and the John Hope Franklin Research Scholar at Duke University. Professor Lovelace received his JD and PhD from the University of Virginia, and he teaches courses in American legal history, constitutional law, and race and the law. His scholarship explores how civil rights and the civil rights movement in the United States helped to shape international human rights law. His forthcoming book, The World is on Our Side, The U.S. and the U.N. Race Convention, will be published by Cambridge University Press, and it examines how U.S. civil rights politics shaped the development of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Timothy, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled uh, to be part of this really wonderful conversation. Um, thank you to the event organizers, um, to Rachel and Peter, um, to the National History Center, um, to the Wilson Center, um, to uh, Christian, to Eric, um, and Teresa, and of course, uh, to Tamiko for this really just fine work um, and timely work. Um, as I started reading the book, 
um, my mind began to think about the present. I know that this is a history book, but my mind began to think about the present as uh, President Biden uh, prepares to nominate an African-American woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. And as I started reading the book, I began to think about these questions of judicial merit, uh, judicial diversity, of objectivity, um, and how they're shaping these debates today. Um, and they certainly shaped Constance Baker Motley's uh, nomination and confirmation, and we'll get there in just a moment. Um, so in my comments today, I really want to do three things and, and tell you why this is an incredibly important book. Um, the first is I'll talk about how um, this book really challenges our understandings of the civil rights historiography and uses just different methodologies um, and approaches to the civil rights scholarship. Uh, second, I'll talk about major themes in the book and the importance of those themes in the book. And then finally, um, I'll discuss uh, the role of law and lawyers in social and legal change and how this book just illuminates our understandings there. Um, and then maybe several questions might flow. Um, so in the master narrative of the civil rights movement, um, we have the history of kings, right? Literally kings, thinking about Thurgood Marshall and obviously Dr. Martin Luther King, these charismatic uh, men who led a civil rights movement or helped to lead a civil rights movement and to lead us to brighter days. Um, but now we have a civil rights queen. And uh, as uh, Tomiko shows us, too often overlooked um, has been Constance Baker Motley and her contributions. And that the NAACP um, was doing much more than education cases in the mid 20th century, right? We get to understand the breadth and depth of the NAACP's litigation at mid century using the life of Constance Baker Motley. And so in turn, what this begins to do is encourage us to expand the literature on the civil rights movement and civil rights lawyers, that the Black bar has been dominated, the literature on the Black bar has been dominated by larger than life personalities, people like Thurgood Marshall. Um, we might add here Charles Hamilton Houston. But there are many Black lawyers who achieve uh, uh, status, iconic status in their own right, Constance Baker Motley being one of them. Um, and they have not received very deep uh, biographical treatments. The careers of pioneering Black judges, again, Constance Baker Motley being one of them, remain in relative uh, obscurity despite the proliferation of civil rights scholarship in the last several decades. And what Brown Nagin shows us here is that um, racial identity, and this is a theme that runs through the book, racial identity was important for um, the selection of Black judges, that when Thurgood Marshall had been selected to the bench, um, President Johnson appealed to Thurgood Marshall's racial authenticity. He said that essentially when he appointed an African-American to the court, he wanted everyone to know that this was right, a race leader. Um, and for Constance Baker Motley, we begin to understand a similar phenomenon. Moreover, this challenges us to think about the growth of the Black bench. Jimmy Carter, for example, really grows the number of Black judges. Um, and again, we might think about how we can grow the literature, and this really wonderful book encourages us to do so. Next, thinking about other important themes here in the book, um, intersectional analysis really drives much of the book. When we think about Constance Baker Motley's parents, um, they came from Nevis. And so we begin to think about not only race along a single axis framework, but a global South, right? A, a world where Constance Baker Motley's parents had uh, immigrated from the West Indies. And her parents thought of themselves as imperial subjects. They looked down on other African-Americans. And so we see here the diversity of Black America and how those early views shaped Constance Baker Motley. 
her father in particular um, was uh, instrumental in cultivating this regal identity that, Mar uh, that uh, Motley uh, adopted. He had been employed at Yale. And he was a cook at Skull and Bones. And literally, he adopted Yale as part of his persona, that it gave him a sense of dignity. And this dignity carried to his family. There were also material benefits here. The crumbs, literally from the plates of Yale students, helped to feed the family during the Great Depression. We also see the power of uh, the book's gender analysis. Black women were only a fraction of a percentage of America's bar in the mid 20th century. And so in this way, we might think about Constance Baker Motley as being nearly invisible. But as this really wonderful book shows us, she was also hyper visible. She was a black woman who was a lawyer, who was on the national and even international stage at the forefront of the civil rights struggle. And that here she was able to negotiate relationships with powerful men in the civil rights movement. There's a really wonderful accounting of the story of the hiring of um, Constance Baker Motley at the LDF. Thurgood Marshall objectified her. He asked Motley to climb a ladder and he began to look at Constance Baker Motley's feminine figure. But what this book does, it not only right, rethinks Thurgood Marshall and think about his, and think about his uh, in many ways, very sexist politics, but it also understands him within that context. Similarly with Martin Luther King, the SCLC was dominated by men and male ministers. That talented women, women like Ella Baker, had been pushed to the org organization's margins. But Motley, in her own way, was able to navigate and no negotiate within the SCLC's very sexist at times framework. And that Dr. King developed a very good relationship with Constance Baker Motley, seeing her through the lens of being a lawyer, that she was able to use her status as a lawyer to gain new credibility within the movement. Next, the role of lawyers and cause lawyers in social justice. This book really shows us the power of protest on law. This really builds from courage to dissent, right? And courage to dissent, one of the major themes that emerges is that activists working with lawyers, and this was often a tense relationship, helped to create the context for political change. In this book, we see this theme really develop in Constance Baker Motley's uh, character. She's a movement lawyer, right? She has a very different style of lawyering from someone like Thurgood Marshall, who actually opposed the sit-in movement initially, right? She's working very closely in places like Birmingham, right, where there are incredible demonstrations. And she understands that her role as a lawyer is not to supplant civil rights activists, but rather support civil rights activism. She's a very different lawyer than A.T. Walden in, um, in Atlanta, who also rejected the sit-ins initially, right? who privileged politics over litigation, what Brown Nagin called in uh, courage to dissent pragmatism. Throughout the book, it reminds us something that um, Risa Golubov, my fellow panelist, has written extensively about. There can't be a case without a client. And throughout this book, Right? We see the richness of these clients. We see the complexity of these clients. One of these clients was James Meredith as he desegregated Ole Miss. He wanted to pull out of the desegregation of Ole Miss, but Motley um, uh, operated in many ways as his therapist, right? And we see just a different vision of lawyering. So a couple of questions here, Flo, and, and we should talk more about a number of things, but a couple of questions here, Flo, I want to stay within my time. Um, what were the archival challenges to writing a biography about someone so regal and so private, right? So someone so guarded 
um, who is a judge? How did you overcome those challenges? Um, next, in the book, you talk about the paradox of opportunity, right? What is the cost here of civil of a civil rights lawyer becoming a judge? That Motley, as a politician and as a jurist and as a lawyer, she had challenged power, right? She had opened up new doors. She had created new opportunities for others to follow, particularly people of color and women. But once she became a federal judge, Motley, by her own admission, was not always this social justice gladiator right, that we might have not expected. And you use really wonderful empirical evidence to arrive at that conclusion. That's one paradox of opportunity. But there are many other paradoxes of opportunity. And I just invite you um, to talk about that. On one hand, um, Motley became uh, a, a, a social justice warrior, but she didn't always want to do this. Right. She wanted to become a Wall Street lawyer. Right. She would have participated in a structure, one might argue, that would have replicated inequality. Right. And then as a judge, she opens the doors for many people to practice. Right. Um, who might not have been able to practice or practice receiving the same compensation. But in some ways, this reinscribes perhaps a paradigm social justice warriors want to overthrow. And then finally, I'd like to return to my opening theme. Um, as a historian and as a constitutional scholar, I'd invite you to talk about the lessons that we might learn from Constance Baker Motley's uh, confirmation hearings and even career as we wait for President Biden to nominate a Black woman to the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Tamiko, would you like to engage those questions before we move on? I would, and let me start uh, with the question about archival challenges. And thank you so much, Professor Lovelace, Tim, if I may, for asking that question. It does give me an opportunity to uh, discuss how difficult uh, it was to tease out the, the full uh, scope of, of Motley um, uh, because she was a judge and judges, uh, many of them, uh, don't want people to know about their interior life. So they um, will go so far as to uh, you know, actively keep uh, personal records away. Um, I don't think that Motley did that, but she was a private person. Uh, she was a reserved person. And frankly, one of the things that's so interesting that I determined about her is she wasn't terribly self-reflective. Um, she wasn't. She she was, she, you know, I, I think she and James Meredith had something in common in having a, you know, he was an actual soldier, but she approached her job sort of like being a soldier, right? And so uh, a part of the reason that she could do the amazing things that she did is because she wore a mask. Uh, and so uh, just getting back to the, the question of, of sources, first of all, there are a lot of archives that uh, allowed me to find every scrap of paper that I could to try to build a picture of her from the Library of Congress uh, to the uh, NYU Columbia uh, personal papers of people like uh, Pauli Murray um, so the, the people with whom she interacted wrote her correspondence and she wrote back generally. So that gave me some leverage on uh, telling the full story about Motley. I conducted uh, oral history interviews of her family and friends and some of her contemporaries. It was uh, so vital to what I was able to do, not only because I got information from those people, but I confirmed after I conducted the research, my story. You know, being a historian is like um, being a detective of sorts, right? You come up with what you think the, the thesis is and who you think the person is. And then I was able to confirm some of those thoughts. Um, on the paradox of opportunity, I'm so glad that you mentioned the Wall Street lawyer bit. 
Um, because one of the things that we don't talk about very much when it comes to these civil rights lawyers, these black lawyers, uh, could also be the case for um, you know women lawyers who worked in doing the social justice work. Um, they had to do this work, right? That they couldn't enter the the lucrative uh, segments of the legal profession, and one wonders about. Um, uh, just the the impact of, of that on their psyches or on uh, how they uh, looked at their careers. I do get a sense of, um, you know, uh, um, what should I call it? What emotion? Disappointment and sort of lingering disappointment over, in a way, having been boxed in. Now, that's not to say that they didn't want to do the work. As I mentioned, Motley was on a mission, but it is something that is notable, including if you look at, because if you look at the, the current statistics, um, African-Americans are still very underrepresented in the legal profession and certainly in those sectors that are the most lucrative, uh, that are the most prestigious and so forth. Um, the paradox of her being a civil rights lawyer, people thinking that, well, it would result in her being sympathetic to plaintiffs. I would argue that because she was such an excellent civil rights lawyer, she could see weak cases. Um, she could see weak cases. It, it, was, it was the opposite. Um, one had to put on a very strong case um, and just be very, very good for Motley to rule in one's favor. That is the long and short of it. And that's for a number of reasons, uh, including um, because she and the other Black lawyers were under scrutiny. So Robert Carter, um, Leon Higginbotham, Damon Keith, they were all subjected to these recusal motions. And so uh, because they, like any individual, wanted to be promoted and wanted to be respected, it makes sense that um, certainly for a district court uh, judge, you would only um, uh, uh, rule in favor of um, plaintiffs in the strongest cases. Um, and then let me get to the confirmation uh, question. I've been talking about this a lot. Uh, so this nomination has been a long time coming. Um, Motley was on Supreme Court uh, shortlist, uh, according to the media and um, according to the papers of people like, uh, or organizations rather, like the National Women's Political Caucus, she never got the nod. Uh, one reason is because being the civil rights queen was a double-edged sword. Um, it was used to claim that she was uh, underqualified or unqualified. Now, you would think that 50 some years later, um, that kind of rhetoric would not obtain. Um, and yet I, I do think there, there, there's been uh, some, it, it's on the extremes, but we've seen some of that rhetoric. And while there are people on that short list who are eminently qualified, and so ultimately that kind of rhetoric won't work, um, the, the fact that uh, we're seeing it at all just suggest what a breakthrough appointment this is. Uh, it also, um, uh, frankly, raises a question in my mind about whether it was advantageous uh, to the nominee to actually have the race gender construct um, out there from the very beginning. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm happy about this moment. Uh, they're, as I said, are eminently qualified people and yet there are racial scripts that are always, um, you know, if not on the surface, uh, beneath the surface in this country. And we're going to see a lot of that. Um, and I, uh, you know, this person will be confirmed ultimately because of simple math, but not before running the gauntlet. And I'll stop there and give Lisa an opportunity to speak. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Before I introduce our second discussant, let me remind you, as uh, Christian said at the beginning, uh, we will have questions shortly. Use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom. Uh, that way we can call on you and you can speak 
your question directly. You can also um, uh, use the Q&A function uh, and type in your question as well. So already I'm seeing some hands uh, being raised. Great. Feel free to get in the queue now. Risa Golubov is the 12th and the first female dean of the University of Virginia Law School. She is a renowned legal historian whose scholarship and teaching focus on the American constitutional and civil rights law, and especially their historical development in the 20th century. Dean Golubov is the author of The Lost Promise of Civil Rights, published by Harvard University Press in 2007, which won a number of awards, including the 2008 James Willard Hurst Prize. And her second book, Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and The Making of the 1960s, published by Oxford University Press in 2016, was supported by fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. It also happened to receive some four book awards. And she is co-editor of Civil Rights Stories and author of numerous shorter works. Risa, welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're delighted you're here. Thank you, Eric. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me and for everyone who put on this wonderful event. Um, it is a little mini reunion, I feel, uh, with Tamiko and I on the faculty at UVA when Tim was a student. And um, it is one of the blessings of Zoom. I can't imagine we would all be together if we were trying to do it in person. So um, really happy to be back in conversation with both Tamiko and Tim. Um, so for my remarks today, you know, you always get worried that uh, you're going to we go over ground that your first discussant went over. And um, I'm happy to say that's largely not gonna happen. And I was thinking about my remarks in a slightly different way. So thinking about um, putting this book in the context of Tomiko's previous work um, and also civil rights historiography. So there'll be a few moments of interaction with what Tim has to say, but um, but fairly, uh, fairly different. Um, so um, the, there are a couple of binaries that I wanna talk about here. And um, the first one is, is the relationship in uh, doing history from above and below, those are in scare quotes, um, or the, the way we might put it in, in the legal history world of um, connecting social history of the law with more conventional uh, legal histories. And all three of us, I think, Tomiko, Tim, and myself, grew up on the importance of the social history of law, thinking about law really as uh, in, in conversation with social history. Um, I learned that in part from Eric Arneson. Um, I think uh, Bill Chafe was a big influence for us and others. Um, and we've each of us moved in various ways from uh, social history uh, uh, generally to the relationship, uh, as Tim talked about, between social history and more formal forms of legal history History, doctrinal history uh, uh, from above. Um, so for uh, Tim, I think that's been toward international law, legal processes, uh, and uh, treaties. Um, for uh, for Tomiko, uh, toward uh, biography in this book, and uh, and for me, toward the Supreme Court. And so as I read this, it really made me re. Um, re-reflect on questions that I had when I was writing about the court and struggles I felt. So Tomiko, I will apologize from the outset if, uh, if, if I'm projecting these onto you and if you didn't have them, you know, you should say so. Um, but I just kept thinking, you know, why, why are we making these moves toward the, the above um, from the below? Um, and what, is, what does that mean for us? And how do we engage simultaneously both um, from above and below? Um, and as Tim said, I think all the time about how you know, the legal process doesn't exist unless there are clients who feel that they've been harmed in ways the law can, uh, can respond to. And they go to lawyers. And lawyers are, are shaping those harms into legal categories and bringing them to courts. And and it's only once uh, they've done so that courts or administrative bodies can act. And this is a dynamic process that, um, that, that proceeds again and again. But I worry for myself that part of my Vagrant Nation book, which was much more about the Supreme Court than my first book had been, um, was me being captured by the above and me being captured by the formal legal processes, the professional actors, the conventional ways of talking about um, uh, uh, law, and that I, I might have fallen into a, a, the trap of kind of Supreme Court narrative. Um, 
So I was thinking about that as I read Tamiko's book. And, you know, her, her goal here was really to write a biography that would place Constance Baker Motley in the pantheon of great American leaders where she absolutely belongs. And it's it's such a wonderful book. And I, I will predict that you've already done so or will do so in the near future. And um, and I think that's great. But it, it did strike me as such a different kind of book um, than, uh, than your first book, Courage to Dissent, which was such a beautiful and magisterial model of the social history of the law in conversation with the formal processes of legal decision making, where you really show the whole panoply of civil rights activists, social movement actors, um, and lawyers involved in legal change in Atlanta civil rights movement. And so um, I wonder, do you, did you struggle with, uh, with writing a biography and with um, what might be the seductiveness of kind of a great man theory of history or the heroic lawyer story? And on the one hand, you know, Tim was saying, what you do here is expand that story away from the heroic lawyers. But on the other hand, I think for you to succeed, you have to prove Constance Baker Motley was herself a heroic lawyer, and then she's no longer the, uh, you know, the outsider marginalized lawyer. That's the story that you're telling. So I guess I was wondering, you know, does that does that trap that I see sort of being set? Um, does that does that disappear because you are talking about a woman of color and a, a, a civil rights lawyer and someone who, you know, began in very modest circumstances? and you're talking explicitly about the price of admission, do you feel like that that dissolves the trap for you? Um, does it so fundamentally change the nature of great man history, great white man history, by talking about a woman of color that you, you've dissolved this tension between above and below? Um, you know, or, or did you find the genre constraining you in, uh, in the way you might uh, think about that? You know, another possible answer uh, to the tension is what Tim suggests, that she was a movement lawyer, and so that's the way you bring these two pieces uh, together. And then the third possibility is something Tim also referenced, right, is no cases without clients and the way you talk about the clients in these cases and I too was really struck by the Meredith, uh, the Meredith story, which was so, um, it was so poignant and painful um, and, and the way that, uh, that she interacted uh, with them. So does that help you kind of straddle uh, this divide? So the, the overarching question here is, you know, how do you think about this book in the context of your own uh, approaches to social history and legal history? Um, do you see it as consonant with the first? Do you see that you're doing something else and that's good? And you, you, we can always change and make write new books and new genres and new ways. Or did you feel those tensions that uh, that I felt and sort of projected on as I read? Um, a related um, and second theme that I wanted to explore in the context of I think how you and Tim and I all have historically approached legal history, and that I think is a big theme in recent civil rights legal history, um, is the importance of lawyers. And um, and you say at one point in the book, and I guess one sort of sub question is how much do you think this or how strong an argument did you mean this to be? And maybe I, you know, fixated on it when you didn't mean it to be quite as strong. Um, you know, you say one, at one point that her time as judge is the, the most important part of, of her biography. Um, and, and I wonder what you mean by that, if you mean that in terms of um, her, it, her own life, if you mean that in terms of the impact that she's had on the world and the conversation you were just having with Tim about, you know, the nominations today and her being a pioneer as the first black woman judge. Um, but I, I feel like one of the things that I took away from the book was um, how you showed the importance of her role as a lawyer and, um, and, and how she was concerned, constrained, obviously, all lawyers, everyone's constrained in their roles, but um, that her constraints on, on, uh, on, her, uh, on, on her as a judge seemed more significant than her constraints on her as a lawyer. I wonder if you think that was um, the case or not. Um, but in terms of being a movement lawyer and trying to um, create change, you know, you added something that I hadn't uh, taken away as much uh, from the book when you were talking just now about how, you know, she was a really good lawyer. And so she gets these cases and she knows which ones are good and which ones are not good. And she's going to um, only really uh, uh, rule for the plaintiffs when they're good. But one of the pieces I was wondering about that you also 
pointed to a little bit a minute ago was, you know, how much was her professional ambition part of these constraints? So, um, you know, she, she, I take it, and I, I, this seems exactly right to me, um, that she was constrained because of the criticisms of her, both during the nomination and confirmation process and beyond with recusals and things like that, that she was trying to show that she could be a neutral judge. But to what extent was her hope for elevation um, part of that? Um, and, uh, and do you think that's an inevitable part of being a district court judge is that hope? And then um, those professional ambitions as, as kind of being in tension with maybe her, her, movement, um, her movement goals. And I think they're about Thurgood Marshall as a possible foil, right? So he's, he's, um, he's never a district court judge, but he's an appellate judge but only for about four years that he goes and becomes Solicitor General and then he's on the Supreme Court. So he was not, when he was on the Supreme Court, there was nowhere else to go, right? That wasn't a constraint that he faced. So I, I wonder how you um, compare the two of them. And that leads me to a, a, a more substantive kind of in the weeds, uh, civil rights doctrine kind of question about um, the, the cases that she did um, when she was a, a judge. And um, you talk about how the cases where she really pushed civil rights law forward, like the blank case and the, um, the locker room case that you mentioned, um, you know, those are with fairly high status um, complainants, uh, plaintiffs who are really making claims about, you know, um, uh, non-intersectional discrimination, right? Fairly clear, one level, one dimensional discrimination. And the kinds of plaintiffs who have a harder time because our civil rights law has made it harder, um, vindicating their claims are those who are more intersectional, not only gender race, but also class. And one of the transformations that I think Thurgood Marshall really goes through while he's a judge is moving from what I think was a more kind of anti-discrimination lens on civil rights law when he was a lawyer, um, a kind of more colorblind approach to a more anti-subordination based approach, really thinking about caste um, and what we would call today equity, I think. Um, and I wonder if you think um, that uh, that Judge Motley did not do that and, and uh, or to the extent to which she did that. And then is that um, related to the kinds of things you were talking about before? Is that related to the possibility or not of eleva elevation um, uh, and what you think about that? Um, the last thing I'll mention, um, there, this, it's such a rich book and I have so many more bi binaries to, to share if you want, um, but, but I'm just going to mention one more for now and then, uh, and then turn it back to you. So the last one is um, where I also saw in this book um, something that I struggled with in my vagrancy book is when you're telling a new story and part of your goal is to put this story out there in the world and show the importance of the story, um, uh, it's hard to simultaneously critique the subject of the story. Um, and so I think, you know, for, for, for me, um, I'm right, I was trying to write about vagrancy and that this was an important change in the law. And so then I found it difficult to then also talk about, well, where does the law fail still, right? What, wh where, where does the, this change in vagrancy laws not do as much as one might want? Um, and I was thinking about with you, right, you're placing uh, Judge Motley in the pantheon. Um, uh, and, and so it is a kind of heroic story and I think should be, but I wonder if that made you feel, and I think you do in all the ways that, um, that you and Tim were just talking about, you do have critiques um, of her in various ways, but I just wondered, you know, were there critiques that, you know, fell to the cutting room floor, right? Were there, were there um, aspects of the story that, um, that were incompatible with telling the story as you were with your, your primary goals or that you, you know, didn't do as much with as you, as you might've done. So, um, so I, I, those were the questions and uh, there's so much more to say and I look forward to the conversation and thank you for inviting me to share those thoughts. Thank you. Tamiko, thoughts, responses? Yes, thank you, Risa. That, the, those questions are just excellent. And uh, there were, were many of them. And so I'm just going to uh, throw out some reactions to a few. Um, one framework that you might be interested in for, for my scholarship um, is an essay written by John Hope Franklin a long time ago, where you know the dean of African-American historians where he um, advised young scholars to write one of, of each type of books 
with the books being the types being a biography, a local history, a state history, a sweeping uh, explanation of um, uh, American history. And that stayed with me. Um, and I, I, I think that one of the things I'm doing here is moving down the list. Uh, so, so my next aspiration is to, to write something that's really sweeping uh, in scope. And it, there are ways in which both uh, Courage and this book do sweep. Um, but I, I want to write something that's, that's uh, next that is truly sweeping. And so that's one framework for understanding um, where I'm going here. Um, on the question of promotion, and professionalism, ambition. Um, you know, I think Motley could have been a very different judge had she secured that appellate appointment. Uh, she would have been less constrained. Um, and, you know, I think that, that sort of the smartest thing that her opponents did was actually prevent her from being an appellate court judge. Uh, many of the, the decisions that she issued that were truly innovative were um, were uh, reversed or aspects of them by the Second Circuit. Uh, I think that uh, she, she would have done um, some really innovative things, more innovative things, I should say, um, had she achieved that level. She wanted to be promoted like other people. Uh, and I have some quotes scattered uh, about her ambitions. Ultimately, though, she did call them like she saw them. So, for instance, the Sostra case, which I talk about in my book, it's about uh, this jailhouse lawyer who argues that solitary confinement is unconstitutional. She rules on his behalf. She awards him damages. This is just a super controversial case. Uh, she gets tremendous blowback from law enforcement and it was really courageous. It was courageous ruling. She didn't have to do that. Um, no, no one would fault her if she didn't rule on behalf of a prisoner. And so she's she's really on, uh, uh, she's prescient about mass incarceration. Um, and I, I, I give her a lot of credit for that. Uh, so yes, she wanted to be promoted, but it, it didn't cause her to, um, uh, you know, she pursued her principles when she thought it was deserved. Um, so binaries. I do think that in the span of this book, I'm doing both above and below. Um, and I like that. I like the ability to do that. And I, through the lens of her clients, I do critique her. For instance, the University of Alabama case with authoring Lucy and Polly Ann Meyer. Uh, Polly Ann Meyer was dropped because the University of Alabama found out that she had had a child before marriage. And um, Motley was she's like, okay, <laughs> you're, you're dropped. Um, she, she believed in respectability and she wasn't going to let uh, an individual student, no matter how uh, deserving and a sense of the education itself uh, impede her uh, legal strategy. And, and there are other moments where I, uh, looking through the lens of the client, I, I critique not only Motley, but the NAACP strategy, which is something, uh, Risa, that we have in common. Um, I do think that the path-breaking nature and the identity of this particular judge means that I'm doing something a little different than uh, great man history. Uh, she is a great woman, but there's a way in which being a woman in power is itself transgressive, uh, right? And so the story that I tell about the limitations on her in judging uh, uh, are re reflects how transgressive it was to be a woman with power and how she's negotiating so many um, dynamics, even after she's on the bench. Like she doesn't have the luxury of just being uh, a, a regular old power broker. 
Uh, there's a lot more going on in her career, and I do try to bring that out. Um, what else? I think I'll stop there, and maybe we'll get some audience questions. Um, thank you so much for your commentary to both Risa and Tim. Thank you. You can use the raise hand function or the Q&A function to get your questions to us. We have Michael Novak, who has his hand up patiently. Michael, if you would unmute yourself, join the conversation. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for being here today. My question is, you mentioned that, um, that um, Motley's parents were British. So I'm wondering, did that... Did she? Did that have any impact on her outlook, her judicial philosophy, her her gravitation towards respectability politics, with her sort of attitude like "I'm not black, I'm British"? Or was that not really a factor? Mm. So that's a great question. And her parents were from the West Indies; uh, they were colonial subjects, and were just fine with that. Uh, you know, and that's that's the story that they told. Uh, didn't critique it very much. Uh, played God save the Queen. Uh, couldn't speak. Uh, no one could could critique. And um, uh, the Crown. It's just a very interesting reality. They were culturally conservative. Uh, believed in respectability. Certainly, her father was very traditional in terms of gender norms. The most interesting thing about the household is the way in which her father really denigrated American Blacks, uh, contrasting African Americans to um, the you know, Novicians and other West Indians, saying that the African Americans allowed themselves to be debased. Uh, and I um, interpret that in terms of something that the, the sociologist Mary Waters has said, which is, uh, essentially, it turns out that um, Caribbean immigrants are immigrants. And in this country, uh, a pathway to acceptance for immigrants and even identity formation is to define oneself against African-Americans. And that is what he did. Uh, he's doing that you know, from uh, his what he thinks of as his perch in, in, in New Haven at Yale. Uh, reading into himself the privilege of his charges. It's a, it's a truly interesting story, not one that is often uh, told, kind of embarrassing for people who want to flatten Black identity into something that's you know, simple and um, uh, ideologically uh, aligned with progressivism. That's not always the case. We should know that. We can look at the Supreme Court and see that, but nevertheless, people just want it to be true. Um, and and uh, I think it's important to have these examples of uh, to, to show that uh, actually um, there are all kinds of ways, all kinds of vectors of experience that shape how people come out politically, what they pursue in terms of profession, uh, how they are culturally and so forth. Thank you for that question. I should add that uh, Risa and Timothy, feel free to join the conversation um, if you wish. So I, I have a question that, that well, I have many questions um, that I would like to pose. Um, and the, the first centers on her politics. So in the 1960s, she runs for public office and wins. She is a liberal. She's nominated for a judicial appointment and James Eastland whips out accusations of a left-wing past. She's affiliated with the Communist Party. Earlier in the book, you recreate sort of networks that she participates in. And you do note that among the people she rubbed shoulders with in, in, in activist Harlem uh, was Lewis Burnham, Edward Strong, and Benjamin Davis, all prominent local communists at a time when politics of the left was 
quite divided and she's clearly leaning toward them. I'm wondering if you could talk about that early radicalism and what you make of it um, and when and how did she shed it uh, over time? Wow, that's a great question, uh, Eric, and, and uh, makes a perfect sense coming from you, given the, <laughs> the subject that you study. Um, I loved exploring that part of her history. You know, the Great Depression, leftist politics. Uh, she was in the company of uh, you know communists and others on the left, uh, reading the Daily Worker. She was first at Fisk and then at NYU and just, you know, in a very uh, bohemian, lively political culture. Um, what I, I note is that, yes, she's in these networks. I don't think that she was ever a car carrying communist. OK, which is what James Eastland was saying. Um, and, and I do note that. And yet at the same time, I I. Um, validate some of the claims that are made about the people with whom she is associating. Um, and it is a youthful uh, experiment with leftist politics that makes perfect sense within her context. Um, how it changes is that she becomes a civil rights lawyer. And uh, you know, the NAACP engages in um, it's not interested. It's, it's red baited, but it really wants to clean house and make sure that uh, none of those people are inside of the organization. And Thurgood Marshall certainly goes along with that. All of them do. And so it's within the professionalization process that she sets aside her leftist politics, right, which is in part a story um, that Risa tells in her book, right, about um, how these lawyers uh, have to become more mainstream um, over time. And one of the things that I, I really enjoyed about the Motley Project is being able to show that evolution um, and then to show again that when she goes into New York City politics, she um, also has, she, she moves to the center she is at the center. That's just what she has become. And uh, the folks on the left then are you know, Malcolm X, very, Adam Clayton Powell, uh, various um, Black power advocates. You know, she's right there in Harlem. It's politically diverse. And of course, being in the center makes her very attractive. Uh, to white Democrats, to black establishment Democrats. And it is uh, a story or, or a reason for her ascent. Um, like if you if your choice is between Malcolm X and Constance Baker Motley, you're going for Constance Baker Motley. Right. If, if you're if you're a, a person in, in power in uh, New York politics and uh, so, so one of the, the themes in this book when I'm uh, exploring the questions about, you know, the price of the ticket, it's it's a story about who is able to attain these positions, right? The, these positions on the inside, and it's people like Constance Baker Motley. Um, it, it's not it's not uh, Polly Murray, right? Who, who who someone's trying to appoint to a judgeship, and uh, so it, it's it's um, it's just been a wonderful project. Uh, allowing me to engage these various uh, subgroups, subcultures, different eras uh, where we saw the evolution of, um, you know, uh, political ideology in this country, who the uh, most uh, uh, problematic dissenters were. By the time she is nominated for the judgeship, it's the, the, the Black power advocates, the student protesters, uh, anti-war protesters. And so again, uh, no one denies that she had had these leftist connections, but it doesn't seem so bad after all. Thank, Thank you. you Christian. We have a question uh, in uh, the Q&A &A from, from Lena Matthews. Matthews. I'm wondering I'm about the excited. issue of personal life. In my study of American history, I've learned that many pioneering women have had to pay a steep price in trying to have it all. 
In the book, you lay out in some detail the personal life um, um, that, in effect, enabled her or facilitated uh, her deep engagement, you know, both in NAACP legal defense fund work, but also um, in politics and then in the judgeship. So could you talk about uh, that issue of personal life um, and what price she paid and how her family facilitated her Sure. Her personal choices were really important. She was married to a real estate state broker in Harlem who had his own firm and thus uh, flexibility that allowed him um, to co-parent their one child um, who you know, attended boarding school. And he went to boarding school at Exeter when she went into New York City politics and was having all of these uh, evening engagements and was uh, essentially, she, she wasn't home a lot of the time, and uh, there was a great tension in her life uh, with traditional motherhood that she recognized uh, she was willing because she had the supportive husband and extended family, hired help. She was willing to uh, achieve, engage in her professional life, but she was always constrained bumping up against uh, the reality that she was she was a pioneer. She was pathbreaking. Uh, and in terms of the costs of that, I do think that um, she she questioned herself um, at the in the epilogue of the book. I note that uh, she said when asked that her greatest achievement was her son, who turned out well, although his mother was often not home, which is in some ways, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's not surprising. Um, it, it shows uh, that there were costs, uh, if only psychologically. Um, she always seemed to have everything just going all, all together. She, she was always cool and calm. And so no one ever would have known that she had some uh, you know, regrets, let's call them, or, or just had some tension or difficulty around the ways in which uh, traditional norms um, were a part of what she was fighting against, and yet she did. And so there, there were costs, and of course there were costs um, that were personal, but related to her professional life. I talk about how her friend Megger Evers was assassinated in Mississippi, um, and it, it was just a, a, a real valley in her life, um, that assassination. And so I, I used that to talk about the trauma, really, that these civil rights workers experienced. There uh, have been quite a few books that um, discuss that reality, but not in the context of lawyering so much, where uh, you know, if people note that Thurgood Marshall liked to drink and party, um, they never sort of ask the question of, well, why? Uh, and one can imagine uh, that a part of what he's doing is letting off steam. It's a very hard life. And we see that with Motley as well. Thank you. We have a question from Maria Shin who thanks you for this timely work and conversation. And she asks, did Constant Baker Motley see any case related to an implementation of Brown 1 and 2 as judge? Uh, Brown 2 created systematic barriers in the Little Rock 9 history. And some might say to this present day, what was her interaction with uh, Drs. Kenneth and Mamie Clark in New York during Brown? Um, I have not seen it in my research for my movie project on the Little Rock uh, 9 history. God bless. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Kenneth and Mamie Clark were part of the Brown team, which uh, came up with the Donald study. She knew them. Uh, and I discuss how she was working in this amazing milieu uh, where the NAACP lawyers were aided by historians like John o. Franklin and law professors from Harvard and Yale and these social scientists. And so she was right there in the mix and enjoyed it. Um, it was exhilarating. You know, they were they were creating something new, making civil rights law, as Mark Tushnet said. And uh, her her sense of intellectual engagement and excitement 
is very clear with that. In terms of Brown, she litigated all these cases that implemented Brown. Um, as a judge, she was not dealing with school desegregation cases, but did have a Title VII case involving um, teachers, uh, Black and Latino teachers, who argued that um, uh, tests, uh, certification tests were discriminatory. And Motley ultimately rules against them. She's reversed by the Second Circuit. And I use it to illustrate uh, just how far she had gone from her days or come from her days as a civil rights lawyer uh, when you know, she, she, was, she was in the, in the mix when they were arguing uh, Griggs and, and she knew about disparate impact, but in this context, um, uh, in part because uh, as, as Risa was pointing out, she tended to rule for high status plaintiffs. So the women lawyers and journalists and um, if they were uh, uh, just plain middle class people, it's, it's someone like the state trooper. Um, and there, I think her, her uh, cultural and, and um, class inclinations are coming out, but also it's just if you're if you're high status, you have better lawyers. There, it's it's the legal process is stacked against um, uh, you know, the the average person. These people making these intersectional claims, and I, I will stop there. Thank you. So I want to come back to the question about why, until now, Constance Baker Motley has not been if not a household name, then at least, you know, one of the many who make up kind of the pantheon of, of civil rights leaders. Now, and you write in the introduction um, that despite her world changing accomplishments, um, her too few Americans today know Motley's name and deeds. Students do not routinely study her work and example. Um, and you, you know, go on from there. If perhaps you could sort of expand on that reason why, and mm -hmm. I understand, or at least I would predict that now that you've written this book, that will not be the case so often. But I will add one kind of question here, and I wonder if it's Motley's liberalism, you know, mm -hmm. that has deflected historical attention. Um, that's not to say that the general public might not be fascinated by, but you know, historians tend to gravitate in some cases um, in this field. Um, you know, these days, you know, the Paulie Murrays, the Ella Bakers, uh, the Bayard Rustins, um, folks who have and maintain a more radical politics uh, mm -hmm. through time. And that's clearly not the case uh, with Motley. So if you could just reflect a little bit for us, you know, on the reasons for why we don't know so much about her and perhaps tell me why I'm wrong uh, in, in suggesting what I have. Hmm. I don't think that you're wrong about the radical politics uh, element of it. Um, people are writing books about radicals and some of it I think is a little nostalgic. Uh, who doesn't want to write a book about a radical in a time when uh, the, the, um, sort of establishment liberalism is, is up against the wall. Uh, so I think that has something to do with it. Mostly, I do believe it has to do with gender um, and the way that uh, you know, historical status is accorded to men that's not according to women. Um, but if you unpack the gender point, it has to do with uh, you know, Marshall and King being charismatic leaders she was not particularly charismatic. She was more bottled up and reserved. Uh, you know, in order to um, be seen as historically significant, you have to sort of toot your own horn. You have to, you have to take your place in history. Um, and there are ways in which she did that, including by writing an autobiography. Um, uh, but I, I think that her, her personality itself uh, was a factor. The way she moved through the world was a factor um, in the extent to which she was known. It's also that unless you're a Supreme Court justice, um, being a judge is pretty obscure and cloistered. And she was on the bench in the Southern District for 39 years. That's a mighty long time. Um, what else? I would say it's the, it's the lack of uh, denial of promotion. 
to Thurgood Marshall's spot. Had she gotten that, um, I think she would be uh, better known. Uh, as I mentioned in the book, history seldom remembers understudies. And essentially, she was an understudy. Um, uh, what else can I say? Um, but I will come back to the, 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 the rank gender point. You know, yesterday or the day before, there was reporting about how the University of Alabama has decided it's going to remove a Klansman's name from a building. Uh, and uh, they are going to uh, create a dorm that's named for authoring Lucy uh, Foster. And I looked at the picture printed in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it's Marshall walking with uh, authoring Lucy as if he's the only person there. Molly's there. Um, you know, local black lawyers are there. And there's a great photo also by the uh, AP of all of those lawyers surrounding um, with, with Lucy there um, with microphones. It's a great picture. Um, why didn't they choose that picture? Because it's just so much simpler to uh, amplify Marshall's status. And that just happens over and over and over again. Um, so it's, it's complicated, uh, but I do think that gender is a defining category that explains uh, what uh, is going on there. Can I, Thank you. can I jump in and, and add something? Yes, please. Um, uh, I, every, everything Tomiko said makes eminent sense to me, and I wanted to reinforce one of the pieces that, that she said that um, pushes back a little bit on your question, Eric, which is the, um, the Black lawyers like Marshall, who have had major biographies written about them, were also liberal lawyers, right? So, um, you know, in this moment, I think the radical lawyers and the, the radical figures are, are definitely getting their more, more um, attention, but there's been several decades of writing about civil rights lawyers, about legal liberalism and the role civil rights lawyers played and she hasn't been among them. So um, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't think that's that's a good enough reason. And I would be inclined to agree a lot on the gender front, but um, I, I'm sure all the reasons are, are parts of it. But certainly I, I don't think the, the liberalism piece is, is probably a big piece of it. Mm. Thank you. And unless there's another question, I, I realized there was one uh, comment that Risa made that I didn't engage and wanted to. And that's the question of um, or my characterization of her judgeship as most important. I'm not sure that I use that language. I, I meant to say it's, it's the highest status, right? It is the most significant uh, if one thinks about you know, who is written about, uh, who, who gets a biography, right? Um, it, it's the judgeship that would be counted as um, the, the biggest achievement. I think, though, that her lawyering is more impactful if what we're analyzing is uh, the, the struggle for equity. Uh, uh, you know, she was a real gladiator as a civil rights lawyer. And that is true, even though by the mid 1960s, the Black Power advocates were on the scene, Malcolm X was on the scene. As I do in my book, uh, courage to dissent. I, I think it's important to talk about varieties of activism uh, and to not discount the NAACP liberal lawyers merely because uh, people came on the scene who were more radical. It, it really took uh, all kinds and there was enough injustice to approach it from various angles. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I, I will have to say the, the chapters in which you cover the various legal cases that she was involved in um, are really quite dramatic. Um, and it's not just the, the legal dimension of, of the arguments that she's advancing, but simply the danger um, that she confronted simply being uh, a black woman lawyer uh, in the deep South, the contempt uh, that so many white attorneys and judges um, uh, treated her with. Um, there's just a vividness um, of, of like the experience uh, in addition to the arguments that she made that I think makes these chapters uh, particularly compelling. We've only kind of scratched the surface of a, a book that covers so many, many different themes. And before we close, I just want to ask about a couple. Um, you have a chapter that deals with the Black Panther Party. 
and a very mm -hmm. personal connection uh, and a painful one um, in Constant Baker Motley's life. Could you just say a few words about it for those who haven't read the book? Uh, and this will give you a sense of just how expansive this book is and how many different kind of historical subjects and narratives it touches upon. Yes. She uh, had a young cousin uh, once removed who grew up in New Haven, an establishment in New Haven. He was expected to make good uh, in, in that family, uh, but became embroiled in uh, movement politics and the more radical variety, eventually going uh, to Los Angeles and becoming a part of the Black Panther Party. And he is assassinated by um, uh, another activist group. And it is the assassination occurs in the context of COINTELPRO. Uh, and so it's a, it's a story about the FBI's movement against um, leftist uh, dissenters during the late 1960s. And it is the framework through which I explore her uh, empathy to say Martin Sastre, who is in prison. He is a talented person. You know, he, he's, he's characterized as, as brilliant often, and yet he finds himself embroiled in the criminal legal system. And uh, I think that that experience, that family experience, um, gives her insight onto something that she otherwise would not have known. And that is just the injustices uh, in the criminal legal system, the law enforcement overreach. Uh, and it is it is a fascinating chapter. And uh, let me tell you, I didn't find out about that part of her family history until very late in the game. No one was telling me about that um, because it, you know, it, it's just not expected. He was this middle class kid who grew up uh, in a five bedroom colonial and he, he went down a path that no one expected. And it was you know, it was a it was a uh, unfortunate part of the family history, but really revelatory. Thank you. Uh, one of the things here that that's really striking um, for me is that yes, you're writing about the past, but some of these themes really are strong today and really resonant today. That there's an entire racial reckoning that's going on, and so many of the questions that are being asked today have just very strong roots that some of them are not so new. And I think that the ways in which you wrestle with the criminal legal system and how we talk about mass incarceration today, you can see some of those roots. We talked about judicial uh, confirmations, but you can think about the sitting cases, right? The power of protest on law as we think about the ways in which Black Lives Matter has really restructured some of our conversations about law. And then uh, much of her work, uh, uh, Judge Motley's work um, touched on, or as lawyer, touched on the desegregation of higher education to be sure we're not having race riots on college campuses. But this issue of desegregating higher education will be back before the Supreme Court in this next term. That's right. And there's a, there's a continuity uh, to the kinds of issues that she explored as a lawyer and a judge that is just remarkable to observe um, that although I, I really dislike the people who um, I don't like the notion of the new Jim Crow and all of that, although I love that book. It's just the frame. I think it's important to distinguish actual Jim Crow from anything that's happening now. And yet there's undeniable continuity and just a sense. One of the reasons I was captivated so much about the outsiders as insiders question is because, wow, they're just relatively few people who, who've made that transition. Um, when one thinks about all of the, the just continuing inequity and injustice. And I, I appreciate your seeing that in the book. Thank you. Now that you raised this at the end, I will need another 30 minutes so that we can explore <laughs> these, these issues. I do just want to say in closing that in addition to Constance Baker Motley being a terrifically interesting figure whose importance has been overlooked, the book is eminently readable. Uh, and so um, you know, it's one of these books that you, know, you can 
pick up and you know sit down and not get up for a very long time um, reading. I found myself uh, thoroughly engrossed uh, in the stories that you tell, uh, and uh, I hope and anticipate uh, that you will have a very large readership um, uh, of, of this book uh, in the months uh, and the years ahead. And with that, our time is drawing to a close, um, and I want to thank Tamiko, Tim, Risa, and Christian uh, for this engaging session. Um, very much appreciate your contributions. And with that, I turn it back to Christian for final words. Really just to say what a wonderful and engrossing conversation this was. It's very late here in Germany, um, but I've been riveted and learned a lot from this just wonderful conversation about Constant Baker Motley. Thank you all. Thanks to Mika, Risa. Uh, Timothy and uh, Eric, uh, thanks to our audience for joining us, for participating. Please join us in two weeks on February 28th for a discussion of one quarter of the nation, immigration and the transformation of America. Thanks again. We're adjourned. Stay safe. Good night.